Good evening and welcome to the ninth presentation for the 2022-23 season of Avalanche Canada's webinar series. Tonight's session is a special one where we're welcoming a panel of folks to talk about how to progress after taking your introductory learning in the backcountry. Whether that was an AST1 course or any other introductory course, what are the next steps? My name is Brent Strand. I'm your producer for the evening. Abby Cooper will be moderating our panel tonight and gathering your questions. Lisa Perzoli is online and she's going to be adding links into the chat box as our moderator. We're so glad you could join us tonight. We really appreciate you folks taking time out of your evening to spend it with us. This webinar is part of a series of free sessions that we host throughout the season. And if you enjoy it, we'd love it if you would share these, uh, these webinars with other folks. Our mission is to help educate backcountry users so you can go out, play safe. We want you all to know more, go further, and come home. First off, we'd like to acknowledge that our session is being hosted in the territory of the Four Nations, the Cynix, the Shkwetmek, Tanaha, and the Silks. As a national organization, we also acknowledge the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations upon those lands we live and recreate. So before we start tonight's session, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, without their grateful support and being loyal to us to support us during these challenging economic times, and they help us work together to, work to reach backcountry users such as yourself. An important note tonight is uh, Backcountry Access. They've been a supporter of Avalanche Canada over the years, and they've contributed to our youth AST and our BIPOC AST program, providing transceivers, shovels, probes for students to use during these programs. So one more little housekeeping note tonight, folks. Everybody's automatically muted. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. To do so, you can either hit the little raise hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and then I can unmute you. You can ask your question verbally with the panelists, and then we can go from there. Another way, just hit that Q&A box at the bottom, and you can type in your questions, and uh, we'll get those off to the moderator there, Abby, and she can pose that to the panelists as well. So um, first off, I want to introduce Abby Cooper. Abby's our moderator tonight and one of Avalanche Canada's ambassadors. She is passionate about exploring the mountains safely and helping others do the same. She hosts events across the province to amplify the profile of split boarding and greater backcountry safety within her community. Abby is also a creative and uses her photography and written skills to so showcase her love for the mountains. So as Abby's logging in here, we're gonna put up a little poll and uh, that first poll, we want to see how do you folks get around in the mountains? Are you a skier? Are you a boarder? Snowshoe or hiker? Are you on the snowmobiles or on those snow bikes? Or are you an ice climber? So I'll give a couple seconds there, Abby, and uh, I'm just going to hide myself here and uh, hope you folks have a good evening. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much, Brent. Um, Awesome. So we'll have those poll results. Oh, wow. There they are. Sweet. Looks like most skiers and boarders and then a little bit of snowshoe, snowmobile, ice climb, pretty even across the board there. Cool. It's always nice to know. Um, and then one other poll, Brent, if you don't mind just popping it up while I ramble here to get us kick started for the evening, is a poll about your backcountry training. Um, these two polls will just really help our panelists answer um, the questions and engage with the audience according to your level and experience. So yeah, this would be really awesome. Pop your answers in there and we'll check that out in a couple seconds. Wow, already. Okay, great. It's T1 mostly. That's that's uh, what we expected. Cool. Thanks for being speedy on the polls, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about tonight's panel topic. I think it's something that I myself encountered was a bit of a, you know, what happens now? I've taken my AST level one. Um, how do I continue to gain confidence and continue to grow 
um, as a backcountry user, where do I seek out mentorship? Where do I continue learning? Um, and where can I just go from here? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I do have an awesome crew of panelists, each with their own expertise on the matter. And yeah, I guess I'll start with uh, Aaron Santos. If you want to go ahead and turn your camera on and your mic on. Um, Andrew is originally from Alberta. Fun fact, I think there's like four of us on this that are originally from Alberta and now reside in BC somewhere. So that's kind of a fun trend. Um, but he's been in the Coast Mountains for 15 years, which is how we actually know each other. Um, life out here, it's a small world sometimes. He says that he spent 10 years traveling on other people's dime. What he really means is he was a professional snowboarder for 10 years, but he is way too bashful to say that out loud. So I will say it for him. He shreds on a snowboard. Um, and then how long have you been splitboarding and doing like backcountry as part of that? Um, I started out with a bit of snowmobiling back in 2010 and then kind of got into the touring world around 2014 or so and kind of slowly dabbled in and had to nice. take it from there. Yeah, awesome. And now, Andrew, I was going to say Andrew, Aaron, do you want me to call you Aaron or Santos? Because I feel like I default to Santos. I'll be honest, most people don't ever call me Aaron except for okay. my, my girlfriend. So you go ahead with Santos all you want. Okay, great. That makes me feel better. Obviously, I messed up your name already when I tried to say it. Aaron. It just felt weird. Um, okay. Santos is now working on becoming a guide, which is sweet. That's where I bumped into him most recently. Was at the Arteryx Academy, Backcountry Academy in Whistler this weekend. He's doing a little bit of guiding. Um, I guess you weren't guiding the actual clinics, were you? You were doing a heli day. I got called off uh, the academy stuff and got to go with uh, Ross from Altus, and we got to take some clients out and do a heli day, which was pretty fun. Not a bad deal, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, he's currently working on getting his guiding cert, which is pretty rad. Um, anyways, this is Santos. So next up, we have Emily Wright. Emily, also originally from Alberta, <laughs> but she did a pretty good stint in Whistler, which is how I know Emily from her time out here. And now she lives in Revelstoke, which how, has it been four years you've been in Revelstoke now? Coming up to five. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Crazy. Super cool. <laughs> and we were just figuring out before uh, we came online, it's about seven, eight years ish that Emily's been in the back country, um, started on a split board now on the skis probably for like five years, maybe. Hey, like since we moved to Revelstoke, you're really committed to the ski change. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Can't fully Much traversing at the ski hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, so Emily's joining us tonight because she is the founder and executive director of Ascent Mentorship, which is based in Revelstoke. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to reducing barriers for women in the backcountry um, as skiers and snowboarders. Ascent pairs up applications, they match mentors with mentees, and they help them develop their skills and confidence in the backcountry, which is super rad. And Ascent's on its third year, second year, third year. Yep, third. Third year. Yeah. So awesome. Um, thanks for joining us, Em. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, okay. Up next, we have Olivia Johnson. And Olivia is joining us from Fernie. She earned her stripes also in Calgary <laughs> as a skier, traveled around, went to New Zealand, worked at a heli ski operation, fell in love with the whole backcountry. I feel like I'm making a very abridged version of your entire life here. I guess that's what a bio is. Um, fell in love with the backcountry skiing kind of thing. And it really kickstarted this idea of like having a career um, in the ski industry, which now she's been a patroller at Fer or Fernie Alpine Resort for seven years. You spent all your years at Fernie, right? Patrolling. Yes, yes. they did. That's awesome. Um, she also does a bit of tail guiding at Island Lake Lodge and FWA, which are both cat skiing resorts around Fernie. And currently halfway through her ops, which will be done at the end of March, which is so awesome. It's a huge accomplishment yeah. for sure. Um, and then she shares this. I'm, I'm going to read it because I think it's really awesome. <laughs> as long as my fuel tolerate it, I try and ski every day in winter, whether it be touring or at the resort. <laughs> we have to know how many days do you have this season? Oh man, I've probably been in ski boots 
every day since like end of November, minus maybe one or two days around Christmas. But yeah, <laughs> I um, usually hit about 120, 125 days in ski boots every year. So that's my feet impressive. Hate me. <laughs> Yeah, fair. My feet hate me for my snowboard boots, I can't imagine. Um, and then also, um, Olivia teaches AST1. You started that four years ago um, yeah. through Fernie Alpine Resort and College of the Rockies. Yeah. yeah. Wicked. You're a, you're a busy human. You got a lot <laughs> going on. Yeah, well, eh. sounds like a lot, but it's really mostly just skiing for fun. So <laughs> Awesome. Um, okay. And then last up we have Dave Norona. Dave, am I saying your last name right? Yes, you are, I think. Norona. Norona? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um <laughs> just like Corona, have... but with an N. Oh yeah. That'll do it. That'll stick. Yeah. Um Dave, this is his first Zoom call, and I am so excited. <laughs> You're already crushing it. You got your camera and your mic back on. You're built for this. Perfect. Um, so Dave is coming on as both a snowmobile sled expert um, and a backcountry skier. He is supported by Skidoo and G3. How long have you been on the Skidoo team for? Uh, 13 years. 13 years and a total of 34 years of backcountry experience. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, I am. I'm old. I feel like this is the Calgary Flames against the Canucks and I'm losing badly. <laughs> Just like the Canucks. So. I don't know about that. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Time will tell. Um, but yeah, this is pretty cool. So Dave has competed in over 400 of the world's toughest races in 12 different sports, um, which is like... I. I read it and I was like, I can't wrap my mind around that 12 different sports. Like this guy knows a thing or two about progression in all areas. So I'm really stoked to have you on the panel. Um, but we have to know what was your toughest race? Uh, you know, I always tell people, um, I, I fell in love with racing when I started and racing for me was just, it wasn't ever against a clock or it was just, in my, I guess my own head trying to get faster. So what I really loved as probably everybody on this, uh, out there now loves is just progression, just improving every time you go out. And, you know, I did some tough races. There's no doubt about it, but, um, there, I never found them that tough because I just loved being out there. I did some crazy, stupid stuff. Um, I say stupid because now when I look back on it, I can't believe it. You know, we skied across Alaska on the Iditarod course and um, I, I had done the course a uh, hundred and mile and a 350 mile XC race up there. Um, and then I stay for year 2000. They're like, we're going to let you go to Nope. And I was like, that's an awesome idea. And it, it was, and it wasn't. Um, but I, you know, that it took us like 26 days and, uh, you know, it's an 1800 kilometer journey. It's long the Iditarod course. So, people ever watched the Iditarod and um, it was I used all of my 10 years of experience up to that point just to get through but it, a lot of times it's just the laughter of someone on a team or some other person you're with we all know the same thing right whether you're snowboarding skiing ice climbing whatever it's you can be in a rough situation someone cracks a joke and it's like all right this is where I'd rather be than in an office or something like that so I really don't, I can't really tell the toughest. I've had a lot of tough moments, that's for sure, but I've loved every moment of it. And I, you know, it's gotten to me where I am today. So yeah, it's amazing. That's awesome. I'm sure some more of your stories are going to come up as we ask some questions in here and I'm really excited to hear about them. There's some pretty wild ones <laughs> on your track record. That's for sure. Um, great. Okay. Well, welcome team. Thanks for, um, thanks for showing up. Happy to have you. Um, let's jump into it. And by jump into it, we're going to start by going backwards. Cause we have a lot of people here that have their AST one, which makes sense. They're learning or looking to progress past that. Um, so I think all of us, myself included have done that a while ago now. Um, but let's talk about what it was like for us on a personal note. How did you as panelists personally pursue growth past your AST one? And if you want to share any of the barriers that you encountered, like physical, mental, um, how did you kind of take that next step in developing your backcountry career? Um, and if anyone wants to go for it, 
I'll, I'll go. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, man, I did my AST. I, my first one was definitely before 2000. So, and it was with uh, a gentleman, Nico Weiss, who te- is an amazing teacher for snowmobile, snow bike and skiing. Um, I think the hardest thing at that time, and I think it is today, is that oftentimes in most of our sports, snowmobiling especially, but I think it's in every sport, is the ego takes over and people often question people so that when you don't know, you don't want to, you, you feel ashamed that you don't know. And that really stops people from learning. And I've always been very much a person that tries to like, Hey, if someone doesn't know, the only reason they don't know is because they just never did it before, but we all didn't know because we, when we were born, we were on skis. Um, so we had to learn. And that's the, the thing I try to keep, um, to this day and in any sport, right. It's easy to say, look at that, you know, look at that kid, look at what they're not, they're not doing it right. This or that. Well, does anybody get up and go over and say, ask them a question like, Hey, do you need any help? And often that's what most people don't do. Right. But they'll sit there and question why they did it or why they don't know. And why are they out here? And I, you know, I've heard it from a, you know, a number of top climbers in the world on, in articles, they, they don't, they shouldn't be out here. And I've always thought that is the most egotistical um, jerk comment anyone could make. Um, it's, it really, you want people out there. And I, I love what, um, you know, Avalanche Canada and BC Adventure Smart have done is really gain the knowledge and then get out there. Um, and that's the, that's the most important, but you got to start somewhere and never be embarrassed if you don't know something, because it's the way you learn. Um, you know, I started snowmobiling when I retired from racing and I didn't know anything. And um, I started doing videos on it and it became really popular because other people started going, I don't know this either. And for the longest time, it was just all about if you don't know, you're an idiot. And if you do know, you're awesome. And we really, I think that's the biggest, was the biggest hurdle to me. And it still is today for a lot of people. Um, It doesn't matter if you don't know, get out and learn. And that's, and it's the fun. I I always tell people, be patient. It's not the, the end result of where you might end up. It's all the stories that along the way of the the learning and the progression and the people that taught you and all those things. I mean, for me, that goes on over 34 years now. It's like, wow, what a, what a ride it's been. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, thanks for sharing that. I think that it reminds me of something that I say now, whenever I go out with people after they have taken their AST one, it's important to remind those people that like that beginner voice, you're never going to have more of an excuse to ask questions without the ego interfering because everyone knows you're starting at the baseline and that's when it's like, you know, the most, okay. It's always okay to ask questions, but in a group dynamic, sometimes it's the most perceived as like the time to ask questions. So use that to your advantage. I, I wish that someone told me that when I got my AST one, cause I definitely was a bit timid on the, on the question front. I mean, I was young, I was 14. I was also just a 14 year old girl that like, didn't know how to talk to their friends, dads about avalanches. Cause that's who I went out with. But I like seeing people get into it now. I'm like, ask those questions. The longer you wait to ask the questions, the harder it's going to be because of that ego factor. So yeah. Thanks for sharing Dave. Um, M do you want to go next? Yeah. I was just going to I like pop in there and be like, I remember when I was first starting out, like I didn't even know what to ask like the questions themselves were hard to come up with. So I think just like spending time reading resources, reading Avalanche Canada, the men reports and everything and like the, at the reports and just ask, like start there. But then once you have questions and you don't really know what that means, then like start exploring on that. But yeah, I remember just kind of going out there and I mean, you were like a huge help to me. You (laughs) took me under your wing and just kind of cruised around. And I was lucky in that sense, but, um, yeah, I think knowing the questions to ask and yeah, like being nervous about looking stupid and whatever is definitely a, was a concern for me, but you made it super comfortable. Um, and you, yeah, you naturally talk so much. So it it made it easy for me. (laughs) <laughs> and Jessa was like that too. I had so yeah, I, I I got lucky into falling into basically two very um helpful 
uh, people's laps that had like way more experience than I did and a hell of a lot of patience because I was, I'm, I still claim that I'm like super slow and not fit enough to keep up with everybody. And that's still a concern for me. And that is like a major reason why I started um, the organization was because I was, yeah, I moved here and having trouble kind of um, finding other people to tour with and getting the lowdown of the zone. So yeah, it's, it helps having like finding your people to go out with and just being comfortable. The female factors huge. <laughs> um, so yeah, helps to have other females in the industry that are patient and you're comfortable with. Oh, well, thanks for the, for the kind words. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I definitely feel that. And I'm sure that that's kind of a universal feeling is like looking for that mentorship and those people to go out with who maybe do have more experience than yourself, but are like down to go maybe at a slower pace or like talk through things, um, a little bit more and mentorship programs are amazing for that. So Ascent in Revelstoke does applications in November or, or is it earlier than that? September. September. Okay. Don't, yeah. I'm glad that I answered that mm -hmm. or asked that, um, September. So that's a great way if you're in Revelstoke, um, there's also mountain mentors for like the lower mainland and the sea to sky. Um, and if there's other ones, um, ways to connect on that front, drop them in the chat, friends, let's, let's share those resources. Cause mentors are not every person is going to be open to being a mentor, but they will definitely help you progress. Um, so yeah, thanks. Em. Um, Olivia, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I feel like when I first started touring, it was with, yeah, just some of the people that I worked with at this heli ski company in Wanaka and they all had so much experience and yeah, kind of like Emily, like I didn't know what questions to ask and I felt nervous and unprepared. And it wasn't until I moved to Fernie, I kind of was forced to get my ops one to get a job on patrol. And then luckily I was able, you know, all of a sudden I went from having a few touring partners to like 45 of my coworkers who were always really excited to get out and go touring. Um, but it, I found it wasn't really until I started going with friends that were just as green as I was that it kind of forced me to make my own decisions and reflect on what I didn't know and yeah seek out this knowledge gap and yeah go to Av Avalanche Canada read you know the Avalanche and snowpack summary every day and kind of figure out what was going on with the snowpack and you know read articles and kind of yeah make myself be interested in all of this so I could learn quickly um but yeah I think you know, definitely going out with people that are way more knowledge, more knowledgeable than you is huge. And you can ask questions and you can learn. Um, but yeah, for myself, like just going out with people that also didn't know anything, we could just stick to, you know, pretty safe terrain, but yeah, fully forced us to be like, okay, we got to do this. We got to make these decisions. We got to figure it out for ourselves. We can do it. And yeah. So yeah, I found that to be super, super helpful to have like just a good supportive network of people who are also learning to get into the back country. And, you know, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that environment, like going out with people that have similar knowledge um, can spark those conversations, like you're saying mm. to like, I, yeah, identify those gaps of like, okay, I know that I have this level of training, but what pieces of the puzzle am I missing? Like, where should I pursue, um, like furthering my education or learning from people? Um, and where did you turn? Like you obviously like turn to Av Can or Avalanche Canada, um, to get more information and stuff, but did you like, I guess you took your ops one <laughs> as your next yeah, step. <laughs> That was, yeah. I mean, again, like that was a bit of a, a, not a cheater route, but a shortcut to getting all this knowledge right away was the ops one. And then, you know, I'm lucky to live in a town where there's lots of people who are super interested in going out to the back country and who are always, you know, keen to go and, um, yeah. So it just made it, it made it easy. And I fully understand that's not everyone's situation where you, you know, have great touring right out your doorstep and, you know, 40 friends that are always up for doing this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, Avalanche Canada was huge. And then just getting, you know, articles and from people I work with and I don't know, just random, just random, yeah, little, little bits and pieces, but um yeah. And I also, I don't know if this is morbid, but I like reading books about people who've been through, you know, big like avalanche, like not trauma, but like stuff like that. And they, you can learn a lot from that because I kind of reflect on like, okay, well, I never want that to be my situation. So how can I improve and what can I learn from this and yeah, stuff like that. So 
Did you read um, Wiley's book? Is that, are you referring to that? I one? actually, I just, I just ordered it last week, but oh. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a good one. But um, even like the Avalanche Canada, like deaths from Av- all that stuff, that one, the death book. I don't know if you know what I'm I talking about. I know that one. <laughs> it's so morbid, but it's like Avalanche deaths from, and it's like 10 year thing. And you can read all these reports and anyway. Avalanche accidents in Canada. Thank you. That's the one. <laughs> Statistics and what happened in accidents. And like, yeah. Yeah. And there was just... online database for that coming up here in the future. Oh, cool. But um, yeah, Avalanche Accidents in Canada, that one. But that was just a really good one to read. And you just can look at all these case studies of what happened and just learn from that. And yeah, just yeah, know, case stay, studies are huge. stay vigilant. Sure. And yeah, yeah, totally. So I, I like reading that kind of stuff. It keeps me keeps me on my toes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like practice, right? Kind of yeah. like the, yeah, the decision making, like the uh, terrain tool on Abby Savvy, which is really awesome. Yeah, For that's a good one. Roots, like how would you reading these avalanche problems? How would you work through this terrain? Um, maybe Lisa, if you can pop that link into the um, chat there, that would be really awesome. But it's a huge tool for. Um, yeah, for practicing, like just understanding what the problems mean for making terrain choices. Um, and I, I find that too, like when you read about incidents being like, okay, like how, like, where did it go wrong based on mm-hmm. all the information? So yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah just really shout out totally- to Abby Savvy. Like that's a, a resource I give to all my AST1 students. Like, I think it's so incredible. They didn't, I think it's pretty, pretty new, like four years, maybe I'm not quite sure, but um, yeah, it's an awesome tool. So if anyone in this webinar hasn't gone and looked at the Abby Savvy website, like just go, you know, start to finish. It's it's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. All right, Santos, tell us about AST1 and how you move past it. Um, for me, I kind of, I was lucky to have a couple friends that we were just coming from Edmonton, obviously off the rope toe and moving out to Whistler. And it was like, let's we want to be in the mountains. We want to learn about it, but kind of like what Olivia was saying, it's just a lot of self-learning. Um, we would get books like the avalanche handbook or staying alive in avalanche terrain and, uh, some different things and just trying to read whatever we could, uh, any articles and then going out and like you said, sticking to very simple terrain, but trying to get through the decision process on our own. Um, and just trying to be push myself out of what I used to be in this tight shell when I first came out here, but I just try and meet people, um, on hill all the time, like on snow days or whatever, what be it any events that you'd try and go to trying to talk to people and get to know people. And then working on my riding to make sure it wasn't ever a question. So that if you saw someone on hill and you kind of, Oh, we should do a run. And then you kind of start getting chatting. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh, you should come out sometime. And then once I gained a few friends that had more, knowledge and experience to me I probably just annoyed them incredibly with all the questions bugging them to go out all the time and just trying to be a sponge with all the information and then kind of as it progressed into other courses just connecting with the people that uh, were in those courses as well because then it's like all of a sudden your friend group for touring or snowmobiling or whatever it is that you like to do just grows exponentially. For sure. I love that. Yeah. I, one thing that I was hoping to get out at some point tonight, and now you've just like paved the way for me to say it is that even if you don't want to take your AST two yet, you might not feel ready, or maybe there's just not one nearby, like hiring a guide for a day and saying like, I want to go out with some friends and we just want to learn. We want to like build confidence and like walk through decision-making. Like you can do that and have it be so impactful like just that one I want to say one-on-one but like small group size with wanting to learn the exact same things in the same area progressing through that is like a sweet way to commit to one day of learning that might not be like a four-day AST too um but yeah and then hanging out with those people afterwards that have learned the same thing it's like you're already aligned when you go out in the backcountry. like, okay, we've learned all of the same things from the same person, like, yeah, on the same page, those people become like lifelong friends. I think some of my like really good ski buddies, I learned on my ops one, like ages ago, and we're still go out together all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just staying in touch with people. And I know not everyone 
can be, you know, very outgoing, or maybe some people are a little more introverted and just trying to sometimes just realize that we all, we all started at the same spot. We all had the same questions at some point or another. So more than likely, if you ask a question, someone is going to answer it to the best ability they can, because at one point in time, they had that same question and they were lost and looking for answers too. Totally. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. We've kind of already gotten into this topic, but I want to explore it a little bit deeper. Um, decision making confidence. It is a really hard thing to feel confident making decisions, like where to go when you're at home and then actively like adjusting when you're out in the back country. Like that's a big barrier for, for people, you know, um, is just feeling good in those decisions. So we talked a little bit about how it's been a barrier for us, um, after our AST one, but is there one thing that has really helped you like any kind of standout moment, whether it was touring, maybe things started to go sideways and you adjusted, maybe it was like a specific, um, course that you took or training or something like that. Like, is there any milestones in your backcountry career that has really elevated your confidence in decision making. Um, and I can see everyone doing like a thinking face of like some sorts on here. So I'm going to go with who looks the least confused right now. Mm. Olivia, you look like you're looking right into the camera. Do you have a moment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a little, I'm like almost embarrassed to say though, because it wasn't like a, a light bulb, like good moment. It was like a light bulb, bad moment where like my friends and I made a really bad decision, like terrain decision that led to us getting into an avalanche. Uh, luckily, no one was caught or buried. It just was really bad. And at the bottom, you know, when we did our debrief at the car at the end of the day, we knew that we should have paid better attention and we just we knew we could have done better and it was like a, a collective like sigh of like oh, that wasn't cool we need to smarten up and realize and that's kind of when it all became quite serious and um yeah we yeah I kind of realized like okay terrain is like the biggest factor in you know coming home alive every day and making good decisions and so that was a big sort of like okay this is the moment that I really need to like put a lot of importance on my terrain choices. And, you know, the next maybe, maybe full year, I really slowed down my touring days and yeah, focused a lot on that. And anytime I'd go out, we'd have big discussions with all my touring partners, like left or right here, you know, up or down here, like this way, that way, like just even little, little micro features of terrain that we knew we could navigate better, whether or not it was, um, like if, if safety wasn't a concern, like if, you know, there was low avalanche danger, we were in a low slope angle, something like that, we would still have conversations about, we'll go over this little convex rule because we know that's the safer decision and stuff like that. And it really just kind of forced us to, yeah, to smarten up. And that was probably it. So yeah, yeah. I'm embarrassed to say it. <laughs> but it's it all part yeah. of learning. And it sounds like, yeah. yeah, you, you digested it and you, you did something with it. That's like really made a difference and helped you have a sustainable career in yeah. avalanche train, even as patrol, right? Like you're, yeah, you're dealing with that all the time. Um, and I love that idea. I, as Emily noted, maybe an over communicator or a little bit chatty sometimes on the skin track, but I think it's really important that, you know, there's not one person just breaking trail in the front and being like, okay, in my head, like, here's a ramp, here's a ramp, I'll get up here, minimal exposure, you know, like running all of this in the back of their head. I think whoever's breaking trail doesn't necessarily get to be like the group leader, you know, you might be leading the skin track, but where that skin track goes should be a group decision. So I loved how you mentioned, like, you know, even if it's something small or like a non-consequential slope, we're still actively talking about like how we're going to move um, through this train. And I think it's a really great group dynamic as well, because it gives everyone the opportunity to like sign off or question or propose like a different route as well, just because it is a conversation. It's more inviting than just to head down, you know? Yeah. I feel like the, whenever I go ski touring, it's the skin track is never silent. It is just constant chatter. And even if it's just like, 
oh, look at that thing over there. Oh, look, a snowflake, a bit of wind. Oh, do you see that? Like it's, there's always something to point out and talk about. So yeah, it's never quiet when I'm ski touring. <laughs> <laughs> I too am a self-proclaimed chatter. So <laughs> but, I need um, that. <laughs> Yeah. One of my um, mentors has been um, Julia Niles. If anyone has ever had the opportunity to work with Julia, she is just so, so incredible and patient and yeah, she's great. Very accomplished as well. But she once told me that if you can't play telephone to like pass a message within your ski touring group, even if it's like down all of East Call, which is like a million people, for those of you that have toured off of Blackcomb, uh, out East Call sometimes, um, she said that like your group dynamic is broken. Like as the second that you don't have the ability to communicate um, with your group in like a decision-making way like the trust starts to deteriorate. So just, you know, if you're in front and you're going fast, just slow down like accordion, you know, like just bring everybody nice and tight for communication. And I love that so much because I think that that's like when the biggest breakdowns happen, you know, if you don't have the ability to even be like, okay, I'm like really thirsty or I'm really hot or I'm getting a bluster or just like this pace isn't sustainable or why are we putting a switch back here? Or I hate kick turns. Like what, whatever the thought is in your head, if you can't express it and deal with it because your group is too far away, um, like communication breakdowns happen and group dynamics can go sour like quite quickly. Um, so I think it's like, I play by that rule and I would definitely encourage other people to play by that rule as well. If you're making proper like group decisions, then you should be able to talk to the whole group all day. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that's, that's super important. And yeah, like you said, like if there's someone in my group who kind of gave me like a side eye, if I just needed water, I'd be like, well, what, what's your rush? Like, where are you going? Like what's, yeah, uh, you're out of the group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's true. Okay. So Dave, I'm really curious how this pertains. Um, I know you have experience with both like backcountry skiing and sledding, but I'd love to know, I think with kind of like a sled perspective with your sled helmet on, if you will, um, what has like really helped you with the confidence in decision-making because you move so much faster on a snowmobile, like you just work through terrain so quickly. Um, and Santos, I guess you as well, I've got a snowmobile, but I don't move quickly through terrain, so I can't answer this yet. <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely, um, I, I love all the answers so far that you've been talking about. Uh, I've definitely seen every angle from, I, you know, a good friend once said to me, nobody cares how steep your skin track is. And I've been in every group from fast to sort of moderate and slow and um, what you said about communication is just so true. And, um, it's funny now that I've sledded for so many years, I don't find it, you know, you want to go fast through train because you want to get to zones that you want to get to. Um, but you, you just, to me, you know, the biggest thing for me, and I'll, I'll just start it off as, as skiing. And, you know, Sando said this, cause you know, he's a ripper on a snowboard and I'm sure what, you know, everybody has to change their kind of attitude that you can be a ripper on the hill. But when you go to the back country, it, you're a ripper, but you're starting from level one, right? And 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 it's the same, you know, in sledding, we see it a lot. People like, oh, they were the, it was a really good sledder. It's like, that has nothing to do with avalanche train and and how the decisions they made because they could be a 10, level 10 rider and a level one uh, avalanche skill level. And um, I saw that, you know, when I, I was lucky when I, you know, I, bought, I didn't buy a sled for skiing. I bought a sled to learn how to sled. And um, it was, I, I rode for a year before I even skied off a, a sled. Um, but it was like the learning curve is, is just the same. It's hard. It's you get stuck. You're trying to get to places. And because of that, you're going, you are going slower through train. Just like when you first start skiing and going out, like when I started sled skiing, it wasn't about trying to, cause I, I've, you know, I've done a lot of guiding and, you know, I, I've taken people out where they get, um, you know, we sled ski for the day and I bring them out to this zone and then they're like, Whoa, can I go over there and jump off that cliff? And, and I go, you know, and this was like, sorry, at the beginning of the day, they were like worried about avalanche conditions. Right. But they've gone from really worrying about avalanche conditions to we get to the spot where we're going to start skiing. And they're like, can I go over to the hardest part of the hill and hit that sweet cliff? And I just tell them, I said, well, why don't we just 
ski this easy line first and you'll get warmed up. You'll see how the terrain is. Uh, you'll feel, have a feel for the train and we'll slowly work over to that if the conditions allow. And they're like, oh yeah, that's a good point. And, and there, that is kind of the, I think the, the best story that explains what happens when you get on a sled. People go from, I'm really worried about dying to let's go over here and it's going to be so much fun. And it go, it, it obviously goes way faster um, than anything else because you're not touring up or you're not taking a, ch a chairlift, which are both slower. Um, and so for me, it was like, I just was having fun skiing kind of, it, it was mellow train, but it wasn't mellow. Cause I was like lapping it with a sled going, this is incredible. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, and then for me, I like going into zones cause I do a ton of touring still, even though people think when you get a sled, you'll never tour again. But what I love about a sled is I can get to a zone where there is nobody. So I'm there with my three friends and then we can tour and we can, it's just super, you know, it's the opposite of what you're talking about on black home. And, um, and that's what I love for me. So I just had to build that, you know, you built that confidence with same way talking and, um, I, you know, I, I don't, I guess maybe I was so naive. I don't even know the mistakes I made. I never have been close to being caught in an avalanche, obviously been in deep snow and slough and, and had things move. Um, but it was just, I've always been really good. And it sounds like an avalanche. Well, <laughs> it's, like, it's like skiing a big line and having lots of stuff. You want to stay out of it. And yes, it's, it, it, it I'm just teasing you, Dave. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, but what I mean is that I can, I've always been happy at the progression level. I've never gone, um, like I always tell people, this happened to me when I started sledding, I'd follow someone who was better and they would turn down something harder, like cut off a corner and go through the trees. And I was able to like, look and go, that's not good for me right now. I'll go the easy way because I could see the easier way. And some people are really good at that. And some people are not so good at that. And I would always, I would always like, tell people, um, try to be that person who isn't in a rush to improve because improvement comes in slow increments. And if it does, you're going to have a longer, better time out there doing that. And it'll be definitely more enjoyable than learning the hard way, I guess. Um, some people have to learn the hard way, I guess. That's what we see. Um, but for me, it really was when I was learning, it was like, wow, this is a big area. And I have to like, think about all that stuff. And now it's kind of interesting because I never even think about it now because I travel through, I've taken lots of friends up who are, come from touring and never been on a sled and they're just like, whoa, 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 dude. And, and you're just like going over through an area that, you know, like, you don't, there's, isn't really too much danger potential, but it's just that they're not, they're, they're not taking it in as fast as I am. And you have to be you know, stop and be like, oh yeah, we're going to go down here and explain. And especially in group dynamics. But I, I think we, I also have a really good group of friends who are, are not afraid to both men and women who are not afraid to say anything. And, you know, the, the, the facts don't lie. If you want to stay alive, have women in your group um, because they're generally smarter and they make better choices. Um, and then it's, it's, I'm not saying that to be, you know, nice or whatever. It's just true. And it's a fact. And, and like what you said, if you're not communicating with your group, it's stupid. And especially if you're not listening to the women in your group, cause that's what happens. Usually people don't listen to women or the slow people. And those are actually the people that are going to save your life. Um, because they're, they're those slower and the decision makers are actually going to, they're going to speak up and say, I don't think so. Or I get this gut feeling. And, um, I've turned around lots of things and made lots of decisions like, yeah, not today. We're not doing that today, or we're going to go ski here. Or we're going to power surf this or, and, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. Those can be hard decisions, but they don't have to be. If you're like you said, I think best, if you're with the right group of, of friends, it, it definitely is harder if you're trying to get into a group or you're trying to, I don't know, establish something. Um, but, you know, Sandals would know this well too, right? It's like, who's the number one people who get caught in, in avalanches? A lot of times it's guides, number one, because they're out every day and they're learning. So they're kind of pushing. It's a really hard industry to get into and push. And that's why the knowledge in, the, in Canada for guiding is the best in the world. It's, it's the, we have the best guides in the world because they kind of learn from their peers and they're pushed. And But at the same time, there is, I, I would say to this day, 
way better than 20 years ago. Um, there's more acceptance of we need to teach people the right way, the proper way, um, and and make them feel like they have to be heard, and they probably have something to say that that can help the older the older people, right? Who who didn't have to go that didn't go through it that way. It was a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate what you had to say about um, just like the whole, you know, in the morning going out and being like, oh, I don't know, like maybe a little bit timid. And then all of a sudden it's noon and it's like, oh, we should just drop those cliffs. Like it's really easy to have that kind of like comfort that happens as you like spend more time or um, not even like days, but just spend time in the backcountry and you're having a positive experience and maybe the sun is out and just kind of that like overall bluebird mentality, even if the sky is not necessarily blue, but like you don't see anything going on. You're having so much fun. It's a great atmosphere. And sometimes if I'm having like a really great time in the backcountry, I sometimes get a little bit scared. because I'm like, have I forgotten about like the risks? I mean, I went there to have fun, so I'm not upset that I'm having a good time, but I know that I need to like check in with myself and not just kind of getting like sucked in to the like the good times and like avoid or you know what I mean forgetting about like the risk that I'm also managing when I'm out there and I think that was a really good call out because especially when it's new right it's like it's much easier to just be like okay we've done it we're out here and this is great and kind of just like fall back seat because you're having a great time so I think yeah having your head like in it actively part of that decision making talking about it and checking in on each other right like if your buddy's like let's go drop clips it's like oh yeah remember we have like a surface horror layer here or something like, <laughs> like you think those get along maybe not like just kind of having that that check-in um yeah you just change throughout the day yeah you said something that's really important it, um let's say this it's like back under skiing or sledding or whatever it is is kind of like farming if you're not doing thinking about something um, you're going to forget something, right? So it's like you plant the seed today for the food that you're going to, that's going to grow in three weeks. And it's kind of the same thing. Like all the, everything you do as you're walking up talking is for when you're going to come down too. where are we going to come down things you can see, maybe you can't see um, what's moving. If it's small, well, what's that going to do to the big slope, all those things. Um, and, and, you know, I do that. It's funny, like, this is so great for me because I do that kind of just normally every day I'm riding up to the zone, like to the mountain on a trail, I'm checking for things and snow depth and what is, are things moving just even on the trail as the groomer went by, right? The steep sides, those make a difference. Um, and you can get a lot of reading from that. So it is, you're right. You kind of have to there's a million things you have to think about all the time. And so sometimes when you're not thinking about something, you're like, wait a minute here, if I let my guard down, something bad might happen. And that can be true. But it also sometimes when you when you make the right plan and you're right with the right group, you can really enjoy a lot of this stuff because you are doing all those little things you have to do. Totally. Like the saying that's like, oh, what is it? Um slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? Like slow it down, make those yeah. decisions. Yeah. I love that saying, but for some reason it doesn't stick. Um, okay. So we're going to, let's see, Santos, I don't think you answered this. Hey, decision-making confidence. No, I was going to, it's kind of pivotal moments. Piggybacking off what you said, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, the slow is smooth and smooth is fast, but nice. Me, it was, um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> a big part of it was just I had an instance where I went to go out with some friends that I'd never been out with. I'd ridden on resort with them plenty of times and showing up and someone had this tiny little bag and I was looking at it and just being like, what the heck? Like, how do you fit any of your gear in there? And it turns out he didn't have any gear and just no one else seemed to be bothered by that. And just being able to like, okay, have that conversation. Like no one was starting the conversation. So I, it was like starting that conversation was terrifying but you're like I don't like that for me I was just like I don't like this this doesn't seem right and they went out and I didn't and they had a great day and came home but it was just like whoa so that sort of thing just started for decision making was like let's just really slow down and not try and just get rad and extreme all the time like you said just kind of talking things through and being okay with like discussing stuff. It's 
sometimes people don't want to ask a question, but sometimes that question can spark a conversation that maybe brought up a point. Or like you said, if everyone's having a great day and kind of forgetting the fact of, oh, this is what we were talking about in the morning, but right now everything seems to be going perfect. So just kind of finding that balance point, I think is a big part of being in the backcountry of finding the, the fine line of just enjoying yourself and enjoying your time in the mountains while keeping safety at a top priority and just kind of rolling with it. Yeah, for sure. And on that gear note, like um, something I think is really valuable to learn for people, you know, just starting their backcountry career with a AST one is like, yes, your avalanche gear is for you and it is personal equipment. You have invested in it. You want it to work. You want to be super familiar with it, know how it works. But at the same time, like when you're in the parking lot before you go out, your partner's gear is like also your gear and you're allowed to know what they have in their backpack. If you're worried that they don't have stuff, ask. But at the same time, like some transceivers are outdated. Maybe someone hasn't taken care of their probe and it's got like a rusty frayed wire or something like that. And I hope that with time, like a partner gear check will just become like a normal friend thing and not just like a, you know, a guided scenario where it's like, okay, show me your skin, show me your avalanche transceiver that you have everything here. Like I think in building trust with our touring partners or sledding partners, um, is like knowing that they have the right gear and that it's like, will actually work if it comes down, um, to that scenario. And it can be a great conversation starter for those like conversations about like risk tolerance or training and yeah, help you get a, a good pulse on your partners. Um, yeah. So Emily, I think that we are left with you for this question. And I also just want to make a note that, um, I do have another question for the panel. We're getting close to eight, but if anyone has anyone or any questions, um, in the audience that would love the panel to answer, feel free to pop those into the Q and A and we'll try and get to those, um, after the next question, but Emily to you, um, any decision making like aha moments for confidence? Uh, to be honest, it was taking my AST too. I was lucky enough to get up to blanket glacier chalet for my AST too, which was like a total amazing experience. And it was like super immersive. So we were up there for like three nights, I think. And it was in the middle of a crazy natural avalanche cycle. So we were literally like watching avalanches pop off left, right and center, which was, um, not it, they weren't super high consequence or anything but it was like really cool to just get the vibe of how things work and our guide it was super good like just, I actually ended up setting off like a just a baby one <laughs> but um just getting a feel for the yeah my own risk tolerance which is like bottom of the barrel super low um, but yeah, just being able to ask those questions and even with the whole natural avalanche cycle going on, what the terrain choices of the guide and stuff were and asking those questions and being able to do that once you're, um, back from the day as well. Like I think just a logic experience, a guided logic experience which was super helpful because you have so much time with the guide and it's not just the time that you're out touring, you get to come back and kind of like debrief and just make sure that you process you've processed everything and then come back with questions as well uh so yeah that has made a huge huge impact to my like own confidence being able to de decision make totally I love that point that you're bringing up of like having the the debrief afterwards like I I think that's really important to if you're not going to do it with your group um, at least do it with yourself. Like after a day, just have like a bit of a check-in. It's like, how did I feel today? Did I make decisions that matched what the avalanche bulletin said? Like, did I adapt in the, you know, out there based on observations? Like, do I feel like I just got away with something today or do I actually feel like really confident? And just that like check-in process, I think is more powerful if you can do it with a, with a group in a group setting, but even just having those conversations with yourself is like, really great for learning and growing. Um, so um, I have a question for you that's coming from Aiden in the Q&A box. Um, they are looking for kind of a couple questions all smashed into one, but basically how did you know you were ready to take 
your AST too. And would you like, it sounds like you have a hut preference over town because you were able to spend more time with the guide, but they're also wondering, um, was it really useful to be in like familiar terrain versus unfamiliar terrain? I'm going to, I'm going to target that question at you since you're talking about AST2 right now. The mm-hmm. um, way I felt that I was ready, I think like I had done just a lot of touring with, um, with friends and I feel like I had gotten just as much as I probably could without going with a professional guide out of friends um and had explored the zones and and whatever and just had more like technical questions and I think my friends could answer uh so yeah that's definitely like the the point that I felt I was ready for AST2 and then yeah hut based I thought was really helpful just so because you have so much time with the guide and you're really just immersed in in the conditions at that point um yeah totally Awesome. Yeah, I I agree with that a bit. I did my ops one at a lodge and I found it um, really helpful. All that extra time to just chat over coffee or in the evening. And yeah, it was also nice to do it in a different snowpack. I did mine in somewhere where I didn't um, live. And so it was just really refreshing to see something different and then go be able to go home and be like, Ooh, what's actually happening here. I have some of the foundation or I have like the foundation of understanding and now I can apply it to a different region. Um, but I do think it's like to each their own <laughs> for sure. Um, if anyone else wants to chime in it, they can. Um, but for the other question that I wanted to ask, um, to the panelists directly is, I know we've chatted a lot about resources, um, as far as like mentorship and Avi Savvy and things like that. But is there anything, um, you know, resources that you find like really useful that we can pass on to the crew that is listening tonight um, to kind of put in their back pocket? Anybody? Um, I don't, I don't have a ton of, I don't have any resources, but one thing that I, I put out the other day on Instagram, uh, I did like a little, we were doing a pit and um, I just thought that I, you know, what I do, um, I'm lucky because I'm out, out in the backcountry every day. And, um, and, and the advantage of that, and I've been doing that since the early nineties, but I'm very lucky in the sense that when you're out every day, you kind of see what's happening and it becomes kind of like, just like walking down the street, right? You, when you walk to work, you know, where the, but when the bus comes, that kind of stuff. And, um, and most people don't get that opportunity. And one of the things that I think can help a lot of people is a journal. You know, when I was racing, um, the biggest thing that, that made a huge difference to my career was a journal. It let you know where you were at the same time each year or, or week after week, your improvements, because a lot of times we compare our improvements to other people. And instead of comparing them to ourselves, how we were last week and your, your own worst critic. So you're never going to think you're improving even though you are. Um, and so having a journal, not only on what you do for touring, like what you were using, what you were wearing for that, the temperature, it's, I think it's really important, like what the conditions are and what the conditions are when you might be at work, right? So I know this in the sledding community, this is what usually happens. There's lots of sledders that come from Alberta and Saskatchewan and they're keen, they're hardworking and they load up their truck and trailer and they come over to BC and they're like, it's go time, baby. And they don't really, they haven't been paying attention to a lot of the stuff on Avalanche Canada in that area in BC, this and that. And that's something very common. And I think it's common across, doesn't matter what you do, whether you're climbing or, or, or skiing or snowboarding, um, those people still will get on a plane and come to Whistler. But if they track what's going on at Whistler, i.e. they follow the weather patterns, did it rain that day? When was that? that freezing rain that Olivia talked about in Fernie before, like over Christmas that she remembers. But if I show up a month later, I'm, I'm, I'm not even privy to that information unless I tracked it. And that's a, a journal is like, can be a really simple way to track that stuff. And it really goes a long way to, you know, track the areas that you're skiing in or snowboarding in or sledding in. And, um, and the snowpack summary, sorry for interrupting Dave, but the Avalanche Canada snowpack summary is kind of like, it's a great crash course on, on what's going on when you're going to a new area. But I agree, like being able to track, especially if you know, you're going to go somewhere is, 
is really, really helpful to try and have a grasp on that snowpack and those problems before you arrive. Yeah. And I mean, just like just how the forecasters do it, right? They take everything from the province, like from cat skiing and heli ski, they have huge resources. And you can do that too to your mo little microclimate that you're going in. And I know I do that in the Sea to Sky. Like it's, you know, we have like Whistler Black Home Cams, we have one at, at Black Tusk. There's like, you know, South Coast, there's lots of people who've been out in different areas and you, you can make a really good assessment of the areas that you're going to just based off a lot of that. And um, yeah, I think that's a really, really important thing to, to get people to do. And it's, it can be fun. And, and then you can just kind of track it as, as you go through your season and use it from season to season. Totally. And so some of those resources, just to uh, share them with the audience, I think they're so second nature for you. I'm just going to spell them out. Um, Dave mentioned like some of the webcams and the data loggers, which will have like back records of um, like the temperature and the wind speed, um, snow accumulation. You can find those on ARFI, um, A-R-F-I. It will show you, it's a website and it'll show you a map and it'll show you all the different weather stations and data loggers where you can check into areas. It's especially helpful for like recent observations. So if you're wondering like where the freezing level went um, last night or how much accumulation actually stacked up somewhere, um, it's a really helpful tool for checking in on that. Um, the other one that you mentioned is uh, South Coast Touring, which is a Facebook group. I know that there's like Revelstoke ski tours. There's like Back talk northern BC, central northern BC, or something like that for the northern province. Um, I'm sure that Fernie has one as well, and Golden has like a ski touring group. There's the YYC backcountry in Calgary. So there are a lot of like community specific um, Facebook groups where people share beta, which is usually more in depth than a min report, um, more like trip reports or looking for ski touring partners and things like that. And I think that all of these. Um, resources, you know, the more we share, the more um, knowledgeable we are as a community. My one, like, just have to say note on the, on the groups, like the Facebook groups is that, you know, sometimes there's like um, personality that comes through, or there can be some false negatives um, or like, sorry, false positives that come through with like conditions and things like that. So just to take them with a grain of salt and, you know, interpret the the beta um with your own <laughs> with your own filters and also noting like the avalanche canada um forecast and things like that um just that it shouldn't be like you know one person's experience shouldn't be what you base your whole risk tolerance and like route planning off of but it's a great way to share information so good call out on arfi and the facebook groups for sure um and then we did also talk about ascent mentorship and mountain mentors um, I know in Whistler that the Arterix Whistler store and then also in Squamish Valhalla Pure seems to do a lot um, as far as just like community events and information sharing. Um, I wish that Eric Carter was listening right now because he would tell us about his like sea to sky with fat map condition reports, which I think happen in Squamish. Um, they also come out an email if you subscribe to fat map and are in the sea to sky region. Um, there's some great beta that comes right to your inbox. Um, anybody else have some great like resources for, for getting information, whether that's like just information sharing or formal, like learning any resources to share. Well, there's, uh, I, if anybody's on a sled, I know there uh, one really great guy out in Pemberton is Tyler Croucher and their uh, broken uh, boundary. And they like, I think it, the, the best thing, like I do it constantly, even though I've been sledding for years, when I go somewhere like in the US, I, we, I get a guide. Um, and a guy, I think a lot of things in North America, people are like, I don't need to be told what to do from a guide I already know is a lot of the attitude. And actually nothing's further from the truth. A guide will recognize your talents right off the bat. And a lot of times a guide will get you to the best snow. They know the area. Um, they're super knowledgeable. They'll keep you out of danger, but um, find the best snow for you. Um, and I think that's across the board, whether you're you know, talking about skiing, snowboarding, climbing, ice climbing, or especially on a sled. Um, I've gone to places where people are like, I know where we're going. And it's like, no, you don't. I could tell you don't know where you're going. And I've gone with a guide and they're like, yeah, there's 2 million 
hectares here of riding. It never gets tracked out. And, and, uh, but most people go close to where they start instead of going way back and then moving forward. So guides can really, you can learn a lot. So I really, you know, on the sled, uh, aspect, um, Tyler, I know he's a personal, I know I've known him for a long time and he, he's a great, great person. He took over a business of my friend, Ray, who had totally awesome adventures where I guided with Ray. Um, and they do amazing and they take people who are brand new. So if you just started snowmobiling, you can go. I've done it. Yeah. I went can, out with them when I got my, when I got my snowmobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I learned a lot. Yeah. As you know, um, you know, on the different side of snowmobiling is you can do a lot of damage to trucks and trailers and sleds on your, in your learning. Um, and, uh, so they, they can help you, um, they can help you do like go sort of bypass all those bad things that can happen. And, um, there's a woman out of in Ravi Steffi Schwartz, who's amazing for teaching, um, as well. A, a lot of it for two is for women. It can be really hard, like loading a sled onto a sled deck. Um, it was hard. It's hard for guys too, but, um, you know, guys are just going to do it and make all the mistakes. But if you want to learn even, even just that, those skills go such a long way when you can unload and load your sled. I think you, you'd know that Abby, like the first time you do it, you're like, Oh my God. It's so you stressful. Yeah. But I have to say in my personal experience, I have seen more guy <laughs> problems with loading the snowmobile oh, yeah. under oh. the roof of their truck. It's like the extend, yeah. extended sled deck up there, you know, double, double. Decker. It's, it's the, but, you're, you're, the reason is, is because guys won't ask for help and they'll just do stupid stuff. Whereas women will ask for help if they need it, which is totally smart. And you can wreck stuff. I've seen people can opener the top of their pickup truck with their, the carbides on their skis and every, mm -hmm. you know, we've all seen the one from Rand, um, with the guy going off the back of his, his, his deck or over the top of it. So that can be, it can all be avoided. Um, you know, stuff happens, but most of, for the most part by hiring a guide or going to, um, some yeah, guides you know, and clinics. Yeah, clinics. They just awesome. man, you, you you'll learn so much in a short period of time, and you it'll you'll have fun too, right? Just I'm I sure think, you, and hopefully meet some rad people to go out with again. Yeah, um, awesome. I'm gonna keep us moving on these questions, unless um, Olivia, Emily, or Santos, if you have any other resources to share, or you can always pop them into the chat too, if you want everyone to to see them if something comes up. Um, but we do have one question from Joshua, who's wondering. Will there be a way to share this webinar with my touring group, which I love? Um, yes, these are going to be recorded. And Brent, you might have to chime in here, or maybe Lisa, if you put it in the in the chat, I'm going to rely on one of you um, to let us know the timeline on when these will be on when this webinar will be available um, to share. But it's usually pretty quick, within like a couple of days. Um, I think it comes out on Vimeo, um, the past webinars. But if I'm wrong. Hopefully one of them will correct me. <laughs> you are totally correct, Abby. And they come up pretty prompt and there's a link on our website. We'll drop that in the chat box and all our webinars from last three years are all posted. So tons of information. Thank you. Um, and then the last question I just wanted to um, quickly address, because I know we've gone over our eight o'clock end time here. So I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, it's just from Adam. He asked um, some more tips for meeting people to go out in the backcountry. And he's saying it's a bit tricky. You just moved to BC. And I definitely feel that because, you know, like going out with people in the backcountry, you need to match like risk tolerances and objectives and training and personality type, it can feel like a really intense version of like going on a date with someone with all these like really complicated factors. Um, so I would say like, yeah, take your, take your time to, you know, maybe meet someone for like a coffee and do a bit of a trip plan before you go out Then like make it a few days before you want to go out and go ski touring or sledding and just kind of chat through where your head's at and your experience. Um, cause it is quite committing when you find out that, you know, maybe you're not a great buddy ski touring buddy match and you're like in the Alpine now and it's noon and you're like, Ooh, what have I done? So take the time, take like the extra hour, um, the night before or a couple nights before just to connect with people. Um, but the Facebook groups I think are really great at that as well as we mentioned, taking clinics or going out with a guide um, as well can help introduce you to those people. The community events, like I mentioned, um, at least around here with Arterix and Valhalla, 
um, are really great. I don't know. I feel like it, there's a store in Fernie that does events sometimes too, isn't there? Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, a couple of, a couple of our ski shops host events and they kind of, it's a big, it's a small town. So everyone kind of gets involved, but yeah, I think one of the snowboard shops last year brought in, um, I they wanted to do like an Ivy refresher course and just brought in a bunch of women and yeah, it was super awesome. Um, but yeah, I just want to touch on those Facebook groups. Like I think they're so valuable. And I remember when I first started looking at those for touring partners and just kind of monitoring and seeing what was out there it seemed that they were really uh, m like not macho, but just people trying to prove themselves being like, I have this certificate and I've taken this course and I do this many days a year and blah, blah, blah. Trying to make themselves seem super like maybe enticing as a touring partner. But now I see a lot more comments that are like, I'm super new to touring. I'm just looking for someone to do some low angle wiggles so I can figure out my gear. Let me know if you're interested. And I think that's really awesome. Like I've noticed this shift in these groups where it's a lot of people that are, you know, maybe just new looking for partners and that's great. And like you said, like it seems to be people mentioning like, let's meet up for coffee. And yeah, so I, I definitely have noticed that shift and I think it's really great. It's way less intimidating now instead of being like, I don't go touring 200 days a year. Like how do I, I can't keep up with these people. And then you might be too scared to, you know, connect with that person. But um, yeah, no, I just think it's really cool. I think those Facebook groups are a lot more valuable than uh, maybe they started out as. And I think it's awesome. Totally. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> um, any other closing words from the panelists? I would encourage um, all the panel, I would encourage you, but don't feel obligated panelists if you want to share um, either like your organization or your personal Instagram account or like who you guide for if you think it's a great resource for people to follow up with after this for more questions feel free um, to drop those in the chat for people to connect with you um, otherwise I'll I'll leave it open for a couple seconds if anyone has anything they want to wrap on otherwise um, yeah we'll close because we're creeping over our time limit and everyone's staying on which is really nice <laughs> we haven't had very many people drop off so thanks everyone for sticking around I was just gonna say kind of what to piggyback off what everyone was saying just kind of reading through those groups often and kind of keeping a close eye on them I know it's hard like I hate social media technology computers phones all that sort of stuff because I'm really bad at it but if you just kind of keep up with it and you can kind of see who is maybe persistent or like Olivia was saying how people word certain things those are you know find your style and reach out to them and go for coffee, go for a day on, if you have a local resort, go out with them and see if they're kind of this egotistical, oh, look at me, how rad I am and trying to just jump off everything in sight. And you're like, okay, is, is this how you're going to be in the backcountry? Maybe this won't work. Instead of just jumping into a situation where people, you know, you're out there and they're like, oh, let's just go jump off that. And you're like, uh, no, that's a cornice. I don't want to do that. But just things like that, um, I find help for sure. Wise words, definitely. Like I, I, the dating example is just like, it just makes the most sense to me. It's like, do you want to go like on this epic adventure that you trust each other with your lives in each other's hands and you just met like on your first date? Or do you want to go for coffee and like a dog walk kind of style? <laughs> like just take it slow, you know? Sharing risk tolerance isn't something that's like, an instant match so that was that was phrased really well thanks for adding that in yeah yeah i think it's it, i think you said it best too abby is uh the, the facebook groups can be uh well they're a double-edged sword right they can be they can be they are really great and i love what olivia said they're um they're better than they used to be but in some cases that sometimes you don't get the true picture of the person and it's it's really wise to kind of um yeah just do your do your background you know, just, just go, like you say, go have coffee or go to the, I think that what Sandro says is the best go, go to resort skiing. And then you actually see what it's like to ski with a person, because that's, you know, what you're going to, you know, a lot of times where that, not that you can't be, it can't be dangerous going up, but, but generally you're going to be dropping into something that, that you might not, if you don't know the person, it can make a big, big difference. And um, I will say if anybody has any questions with sledding or whatever, they can always hit me up on social media, Instagram and Facebook. I'm just Dave Nerone on there. And um, 
there's no dumb questions. Um, I usually cover a lot of, I do a lot of how to videos, how to look after your sleds and all that sort of stuff from debt, from every angle. So, um, if anybody has a question, they're uh, more than happy to, to answer it. Or, and if I don't have the answer, I'll find someone who does, cause I don't know everything. That's for sure. Yeah, true. Speaking of resources, Dave is a resource himself on this panel <laughs> for questions and those how to. So thank you. I'm like a dinosaur. I'm like a brontosaurus. You guys are all like young and spry and I'm yeah, old. I don't know. You're, you're pretty hip. You had your first Zoom call now. So yeah, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> no that's great thanks so much Dave thanks for sharing that personally with everyone here tonight I'm sure that means a lot yeah and thanks for having me and it was great meeting everybody on this I think it's uh, you know personally from where I've come from and what I see now with these webinars and and from ski patrol and guides and um Emily what you're doing in in um in in Revy I think it is that is just super super cool and to get more people out in the backcountry is just awesome we need more people out there we need more women out there for sure having more fun but just everybody and and i think that's the number one thing why these work so well is it is about fun you know i've had this has been my job for a long time and and um and i can't believe how some some people take it they take it more serious than i do and really it should be all always about fun and safety and coming home at the end of the day to tell all the awesome stories we all get to places we get to see and places we get to. I think that's the, you know, for me, it's the number one thing that, that why I keep going back, but why I want to get home every day, you know, is, is, um, I've got a young daughter. She's our, our daughter's six. And, uh, that's like the best thing ever just to watch her wide eyed and going into like learning all these things, but coming back to her is the most important thing. And my wife too, but you know, <laughs> kids, kids rule. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Sweet. Well, if anyone, if anyone else want to add anything in, feel free to, otherwise Brent, I will, um, I'll turn it over to you to wrap us up. We good panelists. Thanks guys. Awesome. Okay. Thanks everyone for chiming in too. We had really awesome chat tonight going on some really, um, like thought provoking questions, started some great conversations. So I appreciate the audience's engagement and our panelists for showing up. I really enjoyed tonight. So thanks everyone, Brent, it's all you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you folks so much. Abby for moderating that, Dave, Emily, Olivia, Aaron. That was such a great discussion. Like so many good tips were show, you know, shared here tonight with folks. You know, I think the biggest one that always seems to come into play is that communication. And there's always more to learn and it's always feels sometimes daunting. You know, we're talking tonight about the AST1 and beyond, right? Like, especially after taking that introductory course, there's so much more, it's a lifetime of learning. And you know, take it slow, stay within your comfort zone and your bandwidth and knowledge and seek out those mentors and partners like the dating game, right? You wanna go out with those folks that have similar interests, the same risk tolerance as you do and they're open to communicating and sharing that knowledge with each other. Because out there, you know, you're all you're all in the same group and you're all looking out for each other. And uh, yeah, you know, Dave's been in the game for 35 years, he's saying, and he's still learning. You know, we're always learning every day out there. So uh, sometimes you always got to shift the plan to B or C. And so just knowing to do that. Avalanche.ca, your one-stop shop for all that kind of information that you need prior to doing that. You know, we talked a lot about Oh, what kind of information do you get and all that? I think the big one that I like to always take home, read the forecast like it's your morning newspaper, just like it's the weather. You're checking the weather every day, check the forecast every day. If you got that trip two months out, you're going out to some region that you're not close with, especially if you're coming from Cowtown or Enderby or Edmonton or whatever, check that forecast on a daily basis so you understand what you're up against. Because avalanche.ca, it's got it all before you even leave the house. So tonight, BCA was one of our uh, big sponsors tonight. We got some draw prizes. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa. She's going to draw a few names. And if your name gets picked, drop us an email to producer at avalanche.ca. And then uh, we'll get that sent off to you folks. So Lisa's going to draw a few names here for us. 
All right. So the first prize that we have is actually a resource that was mentioned in the webinar. It's a Fat Map membership, um, and the winner for the Fat Map. The Fat Map membership is Alex Rose. So, Alex, if you are still with us, um, go ahead and send an email to producer at avalanche.ca. And then for the, we've got two more prizes. Um, for the next prize, we have a wonderful uh, Avcan toque. Um, and this prize goes to Rachel. I'm not sure if it's Ogie or Augie. If you're still on, let's see if you're still on. Looks like she is still on. So Rachel, um, oh, you, oh, Alex, I just saw your comment that you already have the Fat Map membership. Okay, Rachel, we have this toque for you. And Alex, we have this uh, lovely blue toque that we'll send your way. Um, go ahead and send an email to producer at avalanche.ca. And then our final uh, winner in tonight's prize draw for that Fat Map membership Um is Claire Wilson. If Claire is still on, let's just check. It looks like Claire ha has left. Oh, okay, we have a redraw for the toque. Um, well, is Stephanie, let's see if Stephanie King is still on for this toque. Okay, this toque. Uh, oh, there. I know everybody is leaving early this one. Um, okay, this toque will go to Terry Gregg. Terry Gregg, if you're still, oh, Stephanie, perfect. I just saw you. Hi, Stephanie, this toque is coming your way. And then uh, Terry Gregg, we have a Fat Map membership for you. So again, um, I'll just drop that email into the chat, but it's producer at avalanche.ca. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. And I just want to share my screen here, folks. We, you know, there's so many resources at avalanche.ca to help you learn more about avalanche safety, how to plan your trips in the backcountry. You know, if you're just starting out with backcountry education, if you don't have that AST1, or even if you do, go hit Avi Savvy. That online tutorial, it's got quizzes and exercises. It's well worth a look, whatever stage you're at. Whether you're in Brent, it looks like we can't see your screen. Oh, well, grayed out. Grayed out. Look at that. I got probably got like 10 boxes over top of it. I'm <laughs> there you go. Now we go. Got it. <laughs> thank you. I just want thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your interest in avalanche safety. Your support is essential for programs here at Avalanche Canada. If you folks got as little as 10 bucks and you can afford it, you know, we'd love your help. You can click on the link in the chat box to donate to Avalanche Canada. It helps with, you know, these programs, webinars, ongoing programs all over the place. Our next webinar is Thursday, March 2nd. We're celebrating International Women's Day. We're going to have another panel discussion with inspiring women who choose careers in or around the Avalanche industry. They will share their journeys, their challenges, their rewards, and the lessons of a career in the snow. Pre-registration is required, so sign up for that, folks. Once again, thank you so much for spending your time with us tonight. Thank you to all the panelists tonight. It was a fantastic discussion, and we hope you all have a safe, happy winter and get out there and enjoy some snow. Ha, 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 ha.